<clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm speaking on uh, continuing our misconception series, and I was talking about misunderstanding the church. So as usual, to begin with, let's commit this time to the Lord. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you because we can be gathered here on this morning to learn from your word. We pray that, Holy Spirit, you take charge of this time, that it won't be my own wisdom, my own intellect speaking, but rather that I'll be carried along by you to give the message that you want this church to hear. So commit this time into your hands. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. So I'll jump right into it. The most, uh, the clearest one, the most straightforward one is that church is not a cathedral. It's not a place. It's not a building. Now, if you go to the New Testament, now this is one of the tools you can use online. They're very easy to find, very easy to use. Uh, Bible Gateway has a search function. So you put in at the top there what word you want to look for and which version you want to look for. So, uh, for example, the word church first appears in Matthew 16, verse 18. So, if you use Bible Hub and search for the interlinear for this passage, you can see the Greek words related to it. So, in this case, the word translated church is Ecclesian. And you might recognize this from the book of the Bible called Ecclesiastes. Now, if you actually click on that word, Ecclesia, the definition is an assembly, a religious congregation. It's a, a body of Christian believers. And down there, you can see, it means called out from. Because we are people called out from the world. We have been called by Jesus to come out from the world to be part of something different, something better something holy. So you can see all the definition is about a people, not a place. And on the right side, you can see a concordance. If you scroll down, you'll be able to click on to reveal all the verses where this word appears. So these are very useful tools. Anybody can use them, even if you can't read the Greek. So I'll give a few examples to uh, demonstrate the point. In Matthew 18, verse 17, Jesus says that if somebody refuses to listen to good advice, to uh, reprimanding, tell it to the church. So Jesus is saying here, if somebody is refuses to listen, he's in the, clearly in the wrong, then you have to bring it up to the church. Now, if church means a building here, it doesn't really make sense at all. Imagine if somebody is misbehaving, you try to warn him and he doesn't listen, then you go to the empty church building and start telling the church building, it really doesn't make sense. Or Acts 5, 11, a great fear came upon the whole church. It can't mean a building because how can a building be afraid? And in Acts 7, 38, uh, speaking about, Stephen is speaking about the past history of the Jews. This is the one who was in the congregation, the same word, Ecclesia, in the wilderness. Now, if this is translated as church and you think of church building, it really doesn't make sense because where would there have been a church building, a cathedral on Mount Sinai during Moses' time? So it's quite clear in New Testament, church actually means a congregation of people. It's not a place, it's not a building. Now, how did this come about? If you think back to the Old Testament temple, when Solomon had built a temple and dedicated it and finished praying, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. God's presence came into the temple and it was so powerful that nobody could approach it. That's why only the high priest can go into the Holy of Holies. And if he's unworthy, he'll be struck dead because God is just too holy. And God's actual presence filled the temple. Usually it's in the Ark of the Covenant, which is why when uh, he was being transported during David's time and somebody touched it, he was struck dead. So the temple is supposed to be where God lives, where God puts his presence, even though he's everywhere, the master of the universe, omnipresent, but he can puts his, put his presence more specifically in a certain place, and that will be the temple. And as you know, because of the unfaithfulness of the Israelites, Ezekiel saw a vision where the glory of the Lord left the temple. And here's the thing, there is never an occasion where God's glory returns to the temple in the Old Testament. Even though it's rebuilt by the Israelites in Hezekiah's time, even though Pilate, uh, sorry, not Pilate, uh, Herod expanded it, and many people went there on pilgrimage, it never says that God's presence returned to the temple until 
Jesus himself comes. And Jesus is God in the flesh. And as the prophecies say in the Old Testament, he will come to his temple. And Jesus tells them that destroy this temple and three days I will raise it up. He's speaking about his own body. Jesus is the new temple. He's where God's presence resides. So from a stone physical building temple it is now the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ as the temple. In fact, he said when he's, you know the verse, right? In John, where it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The big word there actually means to set up a tent, to tabernacle among us. Jesus is the new tabernacle. Whereas in the Old Testament, it was a literal tent. So we can see the pattern here. God's presence lives in a temple, lives in a tabernacle, and then finally lived in Jesus. But now that Jesus has returned to the Father's right hand, we are now the body of Christ. And therefore, we are the temple because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. So now we are the temple. We are the building. We are the church. So you can see the relation here. We are the church. We are the congregation. We are a temple, a building at the same time as being people. So this is the situation we're in now. There's no church without people because people are the temple of God in this New Testament era. And I'm going to make a pop culture reference if any of you have seen Marvel movies because basically those are the biggest movies all the time now. Now, if you watch Thor Ragnarok, this will be the third Thor film. There's one point where Thor is near death and he sees his father and he's worried because what can he do? Asgard is about to be destroyed. And his father tells him Asgard is not a place. It's, a, it's where the people are. What's important is not the place, the nice buildings and the sci-fi technology and the magic. It's where it's the people who are important. And this is a good illustration of what the church means in the New Testament. So Thor finally realizes that Asgard is not a place. It's a people. And then Asgard explodes. And they set up a little village called New Asgard on planet Earth. And that's the situation we have with us, the Church of Christ, the body of believers. The church is not a place. It's not a building. It's not a cathedral. The church is people. And it's, I find this especially important during this new era of COVID because now is the online church era. Although we cannot meet physically, we cannot even meet in a building, but we are still the church of Christ. We meet each other remotely, but what's important is the people. We are still KCC, even though, frankly, we have not met each other face to face. We have not gathered together for years. But it's, what's important is that we together are still the people of God. And since I raised some, uh, some topics, I'm going to sidetrack detour for a while, but it's still somewhat related. I hope you find this interesting. Now, the passage I mentioned where the word church first appears is Matthew 16. And you know this passage, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, this, has, this passage is taken by uh, some Christians, mainly uh, Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, to teach the doctrine of the harrowing of hell, where Jesus literally went to the gates of Hades in those three days and three nights where he was dead. He went to the gates of Hades, broke them down and rescued all the believers, all those who are faithful to God, who had died before this time. So you can see in this artwork, Jesus has come to Hades, broken down the door and trampled on the devil to release all the holy people from the Old Testament time up to the time where he died. Other passages that are used to support this are Revelation 1.18, where Jesus has the keys of death and Hades. So maybe he didn't even have to, to break down the door, he can just unlock it. And where it says that uh, he led a host of captives and he gave, gave gifts to men, to be taken to mean that Jesus, when, uh, when he died, he went to Hades and he rescued all the captives, all the believers, who the righteous believers. Like, remember the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? Lazarus was in the Hades and in the bosom of Abraham. So the view is that uh, in this heroine of hell is 
every righteous person was waiting. For them, it's a limbo, la, the way they call it, until Jesus died and went to rescue them. And from now on, everyone who dies, every believer who dies, goes straight to heaven. And it's even part of the Apostles' Creed. There's one line which says, he descended into hell. And this is another artwork, Eastern Orthodox artwork, that shows Jesus rescuing Adam and Eve from Hades. So you can see why they would think that Jesus basically went and he died, it was not a loss, it was a victory. Whereupon he conquered death, he took the keys and let out all the righteous believers. Now I'm going to move on to a related history lesson. It's something I brought up before during table talk. If you look at different translations from the same passage, you see it's called the Gates of Hades, or for example, King James Version and many modern verse translations, the Gates of Hell. Now, Hades, as you might know, is the Greek god of the underworld. He rules the underworld with his three-headed dog, Cerberus. So in Greek mythology, Hades is the god of the underworld. The underworld is named after him. It's called Hades. So when you die, you go to Hades. And the New Testament took the Hebrew word Sheol, which just means grave, and translated it as Hades because that's the closest they can come to the idea where the spirits of all the dead go and wait. And since I was talking about Thor Ragnarok, you, can, you might remember the villain, his sister, Hela. And that's where we get the word hell from, because to the Norse, the deity of the underworld was hell, and the place is named after her, hell. So you can see, in Greek mythology, it's called Hades, and in Norse mythology, it's called hell. But how did this hell end up in the Bible. It's because for about three centuries, the whole of England, this whole territory was basically conquered by the Vikings. And you get a lot of Viking words, Norse words, that were accept, uh, absorbed into English. For example, if you look at the days of the week, you have Wodin, Odin's day. You have Thor's day and you have Freya's day. Uh, sorry for you, Loki, no, name, no day name after you. But you can see even up to our modern times, we still, three of the days of the week are named after Norse mythology. Which, related point, la, I find it a very hypocritical waste of time that historians nowadays say, oh, you cannot call it AD anymore. You cannot call it the, uh, BC anymore. You cannot say it's before Christ or Anno Domini, Leo of our Lord, because we must be inclusive. Not everybody is Christian. We call it common era now. We call it before common era. Based on what? It's still based on the birth of Jesus. And you still have Greek gods. You still have Roman gods. You still have Norse gods in the English language for the days of the week, for the months of the year. So why must they go and rename something as fundamental as this before Christ and in the year of our Lord? So in the King James Version, there are actually four different words translated all as hell. Sheol, which is grave, as I mentioned. Hades, which is the Greek word. Tartarus and Gehenna. Gehenna is actually a place in near Jerusalem. It's the Valley of Hinnom, where they throw all the, they throw all the leftover bits and pieces of meat and so on from the sacrifices, where they throw a lot of garbage. And in the Old Testament, where there were many idols. So it's a place of uncleanness a place of destruction, a place you don't want to go to, a place you must avoid. So, makes sense as a translator to hell. And one word in particular, Tartarus, is found only in this passage, 2 Peter 2.4. God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into Tartarus and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. This is a reference back to Genesis 6, where the sons of God came down and saw the daughters of men. So it is a direct reference because of something called the Book of Enoch, which I'll get to shortly. So in Peter's view, in Genesis 6, it's not humans. It's not the sons of Seth. It's not godly kings who came and saw daughters of men, which means uh, daughters of uh, Cain or so on, but rather it is actual angels. 
But this word he chose to use, Peter chose to use this word Tartarus. Again, it's Greek mythology, where when Zeus uh, defeated his father, the Titan Cronus, he imprisoned him in Tartarus. So it's directly from Greek mythology. And this is not a problem. Now, remember I, I use the I use pop culture, I use Marvel film because that is what a lot of us are familiar with now, especially the youth. And what is the pop culture during Peter's time? It's the book of Enoch. Everybody will be reading it or hear stories from it. It doesn't mean that it's canonical. It doesn't mean that it's inspired. It just means that he was using something that everybody knows about as a sermon illustration. Uh, for example, the other week we mentioned about uh, Molinism. People who read about Molinism will uh, want to explain it. We often use the scene of Doctor Strange in Infinity War because people understand it. So when Peter wanted to refer to something that everyone understands, everyone gets, you have used the book of Enoch. For example, again, we are all familiar of the lake of fire. That's where we get our fiery imagery, fire imagery from hell from. In Old Testament, Sheol is a cold, dark place. Uh, it's underground, like cave. And so is Hades. It's cold in Hades. But then our conception of hell is fire. This comes from uh, what Jesus said into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels and also the lake of fire in Revelation. But have you ever wondered where in the Old Testament do they get these ideas? It's not in the Old Testament. It is in the book of Enoch where Enoch sees that those angels who sin in Genesis 6, they're thrown into a fire, an abyss of fire where they're tormented and imprisoned forever and ever. This is where the lake of fire imagery comes from. So you can, you can say that maybe this book of Enoch is not inspired, but it might contain some true points. And these are the ones that Jesus and John chose to take to use as an illustration of what the eternal punishment for unbelievers is like. And as I said before in my explanation of Revelation, the Old New Testament uses polemics a lot. It attacks other religions, other beliefs a lot. We're all familiar with where uh, Jesus is, the one who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty. But this is actually, in Greek mythology, belongs to Zeus. So what John is doing is saying that Zeus, no, no, no. He is not the one who is eternal. He is not the one who is mighty. It is Jesus. So it's an attack on the Greek religion. On the beginning and the end, it belongs to another Greek god, uh, Greek goddess, Hecate. And as we as mentioned just now, he holds the deaths, the keys of death and Hades, another Greek god. So he's saying that Hades doesn't have power over Jesus. Jesus has power over Hades, over death. In the Old Testament, when Elijah had a showdown in the prophets of Baal, Baal is the god of rain, the god of lightning. You can see in this statue, uh, this carving, Baal is holding a lightning burst. So when Elijah I had a challenge in the process of Baal for many years. There was no rain. Where's your power, Baal? And to set fire to the sacrifice, there was fire from heaven, lightning, to show that the real God who controls everything, including the weather, is Yahweh. And even the 10 plagues on Egypt, it was an attack on the gods of Egypt. They have no power to stop Yahweh. So over and over in the Old New Testament, you see the writers taking things which belong to other gods, other religions, other mythologies, and repurposing them to show that God, Jesus, is the true one who controls the universe. Uh, sorry for the detour. I move on to my second point, that church is not a club. On the one hand, church is a bit like a club because when you join a club, there are rules. For example, if you want to be a, a scout, you have to follow certain rules. You can't go into a club and say, oh, I want to do things my way. All the rules change to follow me. No, that's not how it works. But that's how many modern progressive Christians, liberals, want it to work. They come to the church and they say, this, that, that, the way you do things is wrong. It's hateful. We, that's not how it should be done. That's not what Jesus would have wanted. So they come and change things. In that sense, 
Church is like a club. You're supposed to follow the rules. But on the other hand, a club is members only. A club is exclusivist. A club, a club puts up walls to keep other people outside. They like to feel special. They like to feel unique. And they limit who can join. This is not what church should be. It's not what we should be. Jesus said that we are a light, a city on a hill. When you light, put up, open a light, you don't hide it selfishly. We are supposed to be the salt and the light for the whole world. We are not supposed to be a little exclusive club. Just because we are safe, we all go and hide inside the walls and wait until we die to go to heaven. We're supposed to go out and carry the Great Commission. We're supposed to love those who need the light. And church is not a club that's there to provide you with everything you want. And if they don't, oh, this club don't have, uh, don't have nice sandwiches. This club don't have a nice atmosphere. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to quit the club. I'm going to find a new club. I'm going to jump to another club. Church is not a club. What I compare church to is a marriage. Now, let me explain. In a marriage, you love your spouse because your spouse is your spouse. That's the reason. There's lots of reasons you like your spouse. You like the way they talk. You like how they treat you. You like that you're responsible for, for the family and so on and so forth. You like how they look. Yes, those are all reasons to like someone but you love your husband or your wife because they are them. You love your wife because she is your wife. You love your husband because he's your husband. No other reason to keep on loving them except for that. That's why however they change, they, they will surely change over the years, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse, for better or for worse, but you still choose to love them. At the same time, go back in time. Why did you choose your spouse? If you tell me that you had nothing to do with being attracted to them, nothing to do with liking them, either is you're from the era of arranged marriage or you're bluffing. If you never knew the person, how can you say, I love you because you are you? You don't know who they are. That's completely blind. That's a, like Disney films, at least before Frozen. You chose somebody because they have certain aspects, certain things which attract you. Why do you choose, choose that person and not everyone else? Because they are different. Because they have something that you like, something that you want. Because for guys, la, she's pretty. Be honest about it. La. If the girl not pretty, you don't want to tackle her. Yes, guys are very shallow. But girls also, there are reasons you chose somebody. Superficial reasons, maybe. I mean, like even, uh, even Jacob, Jacob saw Rachel and thought she's beautiful. He didn't want to choose Leah because she's beautiful. For other reason, ah, that she didn't know. So sometimes people can be very shallow. And yes, when you went after to tackle the person who be your spouse, I'm sure there are a lot of outside reasons, external reasons. But after that, once you're married, it doesn't matter she get older and have wrinkles, not nice. It doesn't matter that she get fat and never shave anymore, they steal your spouse and you choose to love them. And that's what I think church should be like. It's an odd balance of the unimportant is also important. Why? Let's be honest. There are many churches now and many different people now. The superficial things will draw people in. The kind of music style, the kind of worship style, whether it's happening or not, whether it's lively or not. And the young people will see and think, mm, this place not very cool. Lah. This place not enjoyable to worship. Or the preaching, oh, very boring, lah, this guy. Never on topics that are you important to me. No interest. Or the decor, wow, this church too old-fashioned. Or this church not too shabby, just in a short lot. Or even the food, oh, this church always good to feel very good, very good. All superficial reasons, right? And yet they're also important. They are important because this is what will attract people to the church. If they can choose any church to join and they are exactly the same, of course, they will choose something that appeals to them more. It's not a bad thing. In itself, it's not bad. But at the same time, once they are locked into a church, into this marriage to a church, 
these become unimportant things. The food change, the speaker pass on, pass, a, pass on his job, or pass away, and somebody else replaced. The music style change, the church decor change. But we stay on because, like a marriage, we choose to love the church we're in. No more, we no longer uh, hop from church to church. We choose to love the church. So to me, church is like a marriage. The reason you chose the church, be honest, there are reasons that drew you to the church. Maybe you heard Uncle Stephen speaking on a milkshake Monday. Maybe you want a good old-fashioned church. Maybe it just so happen you know people here. These are all reasons. They are real reasons. But once we're in, we stay in. We choose to stay in even if this or that change. So church is not a club. To me, church is a marriage. And the last point, church is not a cruise. It's not a lap up session. It's not a holiday and where you have all you can eat buffet, where everyone, all the staff are ready to serve you, where you go and play all the time. Church has a responsibility. Church is both a privilege and a responsibility. Now, I'm going to show you a video from the time many years ago when I went on a mission trip to a small village in Sarawak. And to get to that village, you have to go on this very bumpy, very winding mountainous road that has no paving. It's only lots of stones, lots of batu kalike. And this van, which had been used many times, basically is not an off-road vehicle. It's a city van and the suspension kaput already. So this is what is... So you can see the shakiness level is really maximum and I get car sick very easily. I was really suffering for this whole ride. I could barely stand, I could barely, well, after this. And during this car ride, I was thinking in my heart, Jesus, see how I suffer for you. Because that's how I felt. It's such a sacrifice. But after this, when we were on the way back to Peninsula, I was reading my Bible, I came across this passage. Suppose one of you has a servant. Would you say, come and sit with it, eat with me? Or would you say, prepare my supper, my supper? And then would you thank the servant? Or would you say, or would you, or the, would you rather the servant have say, say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. And that convicted me because I was thinking I'm so great. I'm so sacrificial, sacrificing my, my time, my comfort, my health for Jesus is completely wrong. I'm just an unworthy servant. This was my duty. And sometimes we forget because we're so privileged to be, to be sons and daughters of God. We forget that we are also servants. In fact, not just servants. The word is slave. We are unworthy slaves. It's our duty to serve our God. At the same time, we have such a privilege because we're not just servants, we're also his children through Jesus Christ, children of the Father. So it comes to that strange mix where we have a privilege and also responsibility. We must not miss out. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with the story of Esther, how she was, uh, she was raised to a princess, a position of a princess over the whole kingdom. And when there was a plot against the Jews, what did Haman, uh, sorry, uh, what did Mordecai, her uncle, tell her? If you don't help, if you keep quiet, if you be a coward, God will save the Jews through someone else. But you and your family, you will suffer. Who knows? Maybe you have been raised to this position for such a time as this. What if Esther had said no? God will not be happy with that. But God's plans will not be defeated. 
God knows exactly what will happen. If Esther had not taken up this responsibility, she and the family would suffer. But God's plans to save the Jews would continue on without her. She would have missed out on the privilege of being the one who saved her people, the one who has a book named after her in the Bible. She almost would have missed out. The Pharisees and the experts in the law, they missed out. They were there when John the Baptist was preaching for don't know how many years before Jesus came along, when he was baptizing. But they rejected God's purpose for them. Now, later on in Acts, you find that those who were baptized by John later came to follow Jesus. In fact, two of the disciples of John, uh, one of them was Andrew. They ran after Jesus when John said, this is the light of the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world, the one I was talking about. So you can stand to reason, those who were baptized by John, who embraced true repentance, would have listened to him and accepted that Jesus is Messiah. But the Pharisees rejected God's purpose for them. Imagine if they had all been baptized by John, been ready to accept Jesus as Messiah, how things would have been different. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah is sent to a potter's house and he watches the potter making a clay. Oh, 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 oh yeah, mistake lah. Okay, start making again. And God says to him, this is the lesson I want you to speak to the people. They think they are such a blessed kingdom. They think I have a good purpose for them. And they think that all, all the other Gentile nations, all these unbelievers, ha, ha they, are, they are doomed. Their destiny is destruction. Ha, 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 ha. But God says, if the nation I speak against repents, I will relent of calamity. Think of Nineveh when Jonah went there. They were about to be destroyed, but because they repented, God spared them. But you guys, you guys, you think you're so blessed, I'm going to give you good things if you do not repent of your evil. I will think better of the good. God will change his plans depending on people's reaction, depending on their repentance, their heart. And so something similar in the New Testament. Paul says, in the great house, there are many vessels. Some are for honor, some are for dishonor. How you know is because if you cleanse yourself from dishonorable things, then God uses you for honor. Similar to Jeremiah, we are vessels. We are made by God, shaped by God, but we're not inanimate objects. We are more like this, this scene from Beauty and the Beast, where the pots and the saucers and the cups are alive. They can choose to do things. So Paul and Jeremiah are saying to us, if you make yourself worthless, God will use you for worthless things, for bad things. You make yourself suitable, then God can use you for his plans, just like Esther. Remember earlier on, that I said that he gives us the right to become sons of God? But the preceding verse is very sad because Jesus first came to his own people, to the Jews, the Pharisees. And most of them rejected him. Otherwise, they too can accept Jesus and have the right to be sons and daughters of God. So it's not a cruise ship. You think it's just going to be a cruise all the way to the end. You don't uphold your responsibility. You're going to get tossed overboard. So church is not a cathedral. It's not a building. It's a people. It's not a club. It's not there to just serve you. It's not something you can just change. Side. Oh, I want to change place now. And it's not a cruise where you just lap up around, where you, you wait to be served hand and foot. Oh, this church doesn't appeal to me. This church doesn't cater to me. It's the church. Who is the one doing the catering? Who is the one doing the serving? It's the church members. Church, rather, is a family. A family is made of people. It's not a building. It's people. A church sticks together. A family sticks together. Through thick and thin. Just because my children misbehave doesn't mean I'm going to chuck them out to an orphanage. And in a family, we are responsible for one another. We're not on a holiday all the time. We take care of one another. We are the sons and daughters of God through Jesus. And what a great, behold, what manner of love He's bestowed upon us. He's lavished on us. We should be called children of God. 
We are all one family in Christ. And in the Old Testament, the Old Testament, even before the earth was created, God already had a family. Do you know that? He had sons who sang in heaven. They shouted for joy when God created the earth, long before humanity was created. But what happened? Some of his family were unjust. Some of his family did not act righteously. Some of his family treated it like cruise ship and they're thrown overboard. Instead of them, we are given the privilege to be called sons and daughters of the Most High. That's why Paul says, we're not only going to judge the world, we're going to judge angels. For which angels? Possibly these ones who lost their right, lost their privilege to be a family of God. In the Old Testament, we see the old sons of God, sons of God, the angelic beings who are watching over the earth, who are advising God, who are giving their opinion to God, but many of them did not take up their responsibility. And in New Testament, we are the new sons and daughters of God. We have been adopted into the family. Keyword there, adopted into the family of God. We're not born. We're not born as this family. Rather, because we believe in Jesus, we're given the right to be called sons and daughters of God. We are a family of God. And family, I've heard it said somewhere before, but I cannot find the citation, but I have adopted it for my own. Family are people you love, but not necessarily like. I'm sure we all have some family members, maybe some siblings, maybe some cousins, maybe some uncle, auntie, that you really cannot stand. But they are your family. You didn't choose them. You have no choice. You have to love them. You might have parents who are really irritating, but you have to love them. You might have a spouse that you no longer like, but God never called you to like your spouse. God called you to love a spouse. As an example from a book on marriage by Timothy LaHaye, the guy came in and said, Pastor, I don't like my wife anymore. Okay, then love her. Mm, you didn't hear me? You didn't hear me? I don't like her anymore. Well, your mother was raising you and you had poop in your diaper. You think she'd like that? You think she'd like cleaning up? Mm, no, but she still did it because she loved you to go and love your wife. And that's, that's what we should do. Family are people we must choose to love even if we don't like them. Because we are the body of Christ. We're the family of Christ. And if one part suffers, every part suffers along with it. If one part is honoured, every part is honoured along with it. Sometimes we forget that because we are still human individuals. Sometimes we forget that when we hurt somebody, when we insult somebody, when we fight with somebody, they are still part of the body of Christ. We are hurting Christ. And even if we don't realise it, we are hurting ourselves because we are a family of God. And I close with this. Jesus gave this commandment that we love one another as he loved us. And by this, that people will know we are a church. By this, people will know we are Christians. We are followers of Jesus. This is the criteria Jesus gave, that we love one another. That's how we're to, to know, not that because, oh, we go inside a building, or because we wear a cross, or we wear a shirt with holiday club, uh, with all the church Bible verses on it. That's not Jesus' criteria. Jesus said, how do, you know, do people know that you're part of my family if you love one another? So even as I close with this, Encourage each of us, myself included, to love one another, not like to love one another, to cater to their needs, to help each other. Shall we close in prayer? Lord Jesus, you have called us to be a people of God. Even from the Old Testament times, you've always wanted a people who would follow you, who would obey you, who would love you, who would be loyal to you, so that you could be the first among many brothers and sisters. We thank you because through your death on the cross, your resurrection, you've given us this right, this privilege to be called sons and daughters of God. 
sons and daughters of the Father in heaven. Help us not to misuse this privilege. Help us not to, to abuse it, not to take it for granted, but to cherish it and to obey what you have said, to love one another because each one of us is part of your body. Each one of us is part of your family. So even as we depart, even as we go back to our own lives, our own individual lives, help us to remember and to think of ways and to care for one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.